Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Rodberg. I'm director of the Center for Animals and Public Policy. And welcome to our second Animal Matters public talk of the 2021 school year. Um, we're lucky to, today to have uh, Dr. Stephanie Borns Wild, who is a clinical assistant professor at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, Dr. Borns Wild received her DVM from the Cummings School and is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. Um, she's currently teaching clinical animal behavior at Cummings School and writes lectures to both veterinary and lay audiences on topics including aggression, inappropriate elimination, fears and phobias and compulsive behaviors. In fact, I heard her on uh, WBUR just the other night um, talking about what she's going to talk about to us today. Um, and today she will be talking about something that's highly relevant, which is the emerging behavior challenges, pets, people, and the pandemic. So thank you, Dr. Wow, thank you, uh, Dr. Rutberg. It was so nice, I barely recognized myself. Uh, so this is a topic that I'm very, very excited about. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about it for my seat uh, as a veterinary behaviorist. Uh, I've seen a lot of the changes, I think, on the, on the front lines here. Uh, excuse me one sec, there we go. Okay, uh, we've had sudden dramatic changes in the environment that have affected us, certainly. Uh, and they've, accept, they've uh, had some pretty big impacts on the pets as well. Um, some of the changes that I noticed affecting the pets or most likely affecting the pets are people working at home, I think it was March 8th, uh, pretty much everybody started being at home. Kids start came home, they, they're home all day, no daycare, no school, public places closed, dog parks, um, pet daycares, play groups. Um, our dog parks in Brooklyn closed uh, completely initially and then reopened for leash only. Um, social distancing, so suddenly we see a lot of isolation from the community for people and pets. Uh, other things that I wouldn't necessarily have uh, thought about that occurred with the onset of the pandemic is an increase in deliveries. In order to get groceries and food and uh, basic supplies, people are relying on deliveries, so there's a lot more trucks rolling. Uh, another thing that's a kind of I think a couple of these things I think of as kind of second generation or second order problems that are changes in the environment that occurred during the pandemic. Our uh, people had more time on their hands. So people rushed to shelters and adopted dogs or went to breeders and snapped up all the puppies um, that were available. So there are or kittens and there are tons and tons of uh, new pets. Um, another second generation problem that uh, for some reason emerged with COVID and as a sequela of COVID is the plague of fireworks uh, that went on from June uh, pretty much as a nightly event in a lot of cities across the country um, until uh, a week or so after the 4th of July. Um, finally, there's the stress, anxiety, and uncertainty that people in the homes are, are facing. Uh, which caused another environmental change for the animals. Um, I, in looking back over uh, the effect of the pandemic uh, on pets, I divided up into two categories. I'm looking at the current challenges um, and then the challenges that uh, when I was initially thinking about them, we were going to see, just when you think it's safe to go back in the water, we're gonna see a whole other bunch of problems emerge. Um, but now with people going back, at least before the second wave uh, of COVID, we uh, are starting to see some of those um, re-entry problems that uh, some of the behavior community have been predicting. Um, along with challenges, I'll make a brief mention of some of the benefits. Uh, it's not all bad for all the pets. And for some, uh, pandemic life has been a dramatic improvement as well. Um, the common COVID-19 behavior problems that we're seeing, some of them, again, I would have seen coming. Others, I was rather surprised by. Um, one big one that was sadly rather predictable is aggression, uh, an increase in, in aggression, uh, both feline and canine. Um, another one, and this one caught me a little bit by surprise uh, because it was the one that I was hearing about initially the most, 
is barking and to a lesser extent meowing and vocalizing by cats. But barking became, uh, was a really, really salient issue early in the pandemic and that's persisted. Um, other attention seeking behaviors, nosing, pawing, whining, stealing things and waving them in people's faces, uh, pushing things off of high shelves for cats, getting into things. Um, other problems uh, we see also uh, less frequently are withdrawal and oppression, depression. Some pets, uh, people reporting that their pets are just hiding. Um, Inter-pet aggression, uh, you introduce new pets, you may have some problems. We've been seeing that or when people are spending a lot, pets are spending a lot more time uh, under house arrest, if you will, together. We're seeing a little bit more in the problem area, problems in that area as well. And noise phobia, um, less because of the pandemic itself and more because of the darn fireworks. Uh, and then we're seeing old problems in fearful uh, and anxious pets that they've gotten the better of that are re-emerging with the changes in environment. Um, so I wanna talk first about dog bites. This actually came to my attention in an odd sort of way. Um, in a, in a, just a little bit of uh, personal, about two weeks into the pandemic at the uh, late March, I, I unfortunately dislocated my shoulder uh, and had to go to the emergency room. And while I was waiting uh, in, the, uh, in the little emergency room uh, area, um, when the doctor just came in, I'm sitting there with my humeral head sitting somewhere on my collarbone trying to think of other things. Uh, they, uh, I'm making polite conversation and saying, wow, I can see you guys are really, really busy. In addition to dealing with COVID, you're dealing with uh, all the regular things too, um, accidents, injuries, illness. Uh, and he said, yeah, but the thing we've been seeing a ton of is dog bites. We are seeing so many more people getting bitten by dogs. That was two weeks into the pandemic. So uh, that's something that I observed when, uh, when we reopened uh, at the behavior clinic here and then hearing from some uh, ongoing clients um, that there's more issues with biting. In October of this year, a study came out in the Journal of Pediatrics that was looking at uh, bite reports, emergency room bite reports, which is one way in which dog bites are tracked because it's a reportable uh, injury. So what we see is you can see there's some variation and that's that's common. I'll explain that in a minute on um, why it looks, why the curve looks like it does, at least up until it uh, disappears straight vertical with the onset of the pandemic. Um, but if you look at April of uh, 2019, you see there's about four bites per thousand. If you look at April of um, 2020, it's exactly double. Uh, if you then go on to May, uh, you see six and a half bites, but it's uh, it's 13 bites. So it's, it's doubling again. And we've seen that trend unfortunately continue. Uh, so there's been a dramatic increase uh, in the number of dog bites that we're seeing. Uh, so who's getting bitten? Uh, Children are getting bitten at greater rates than adults. Um, that seems to be happening in COVID, but it's also something that happens uh, in general in non-COVID times. We're just seeing, basically we're seeing the same patterns uh, so far. We're seeing the same patterns, but exaggerated um, and intensified. Children are always at more risk for dog bites. They present at high risk for dog bites. They, they're 40% of the ER visits uh, for dog bites before COVID. We don't actually know, uh, have the final numbers for COVID because we're not through it yet. Uh, and most of the dog bites that occur are family dogs. Uh, young children tend to be at risk of getting bitten in particular by their own dogs or other known dogs. The triggers, according to the research, are resources, um, excitement, arousal, hyperarousal. When dogs get excited, uh, bites can occur because they can, when you're in a highly aroused state, it's really easy to switch valence or emotions 
on the example I often think of is after the Red Sox win the World Series, everybody pours into Kenmore Square and they're celebrating and cheering. And next thing you know, some little thing uh, happens and they're breaking shop windows and lighting cars on fire. So we see a similar dynamic happen in terms of when, it, when an animal gets highly aroused, they become a greater risk of, uh, they're a greater risk of aggression. Fear is another big trigger and pain. Uh, so, uh, so why during COVID are we seeing more of these bites? Um, big answer is more contact time. Uh, the more time people spend with their animals, the more opportunities there is for, there are for negative encounters. And particularly with children who are always at higher risk, all of a sudden they're around all the time uh, because there's no more activities, there's no school, there's no playmates. Um, kids are pretty much trapped in the house uh, all day or in the yard. Um, so I want to go back to this curve, and you can see how uh, you get a, uh, it's like a, uh, a bell-shaped curve, basically, um, that where bites are lowest in the cold months of the year, and they're highest in the summer months. So it's not a weather thing, per se. It's a school thing. Kids are around more in the summer months. You can see little spikes around the holiday times. So with kids around more, there's a lot more face time. Uh, being around all the time and not having other outlets, we're also having a lot of energy, a lot of frustration. Um, and, uh, and then parents also right now have competing responsibilities. Uh, people are trying to work from home, uh, manage their kids while they're doing their schooling, which is very challenging. Uh, it's hard to be in two places at once. I'm really careful to not want to blame or shame anybody about it because you can't blame or shame anybody for not doing what's impossible. Uh, and unless you exist in a Harry Potter world of magic, you simply can't be in two places at once. People that are working out of the house, essential workers early on were really stretched for childcare. Uh, so you've got this untenable situation that puts uh, kids more at risk of of dog bites. Um, from the, in the dog's uh, mind, we've got these changes in routine and changes in environment um, that can result in uh, things that cause more stress and anxiety for the dogs. Um, there's fewer outlets for play and exercise with dog parks closed, dog training venues closed, sporting venues, there's no agility trials. Um, and daycares have now reopened, uh, but for a long time we didn't have daycares and then you've got more people off work who are reluctant. I have a lot of clients and people I know who would love to send their dogs to daycare, but if you're uh, on furlough from work, it can be uh, expensive, uh, too expensive. So you've got a situation where uh, the dog isn't getting as much exercise and play and social contact um, and I, uh, there's a disruption of uh, what normally happens at home, meal time, play time, walk time, bedtime. Now it's whenever, uh, because the schedules that were governed by school and work are now all out the window uh, to some extent, um, especially early on in the pandemic. People are now finding new routines, which I think has been really helpful. There's also a whole lot more noise and activity around the house. Uh, and when you think about what a, a dog or a cat does most of the day, sometimes we worry before the pandemic, I was worried that dogs and cats were not having enough stimulation during the day and were spending too much time isolated. Now in this great social experiment uh, known as COVID, we are seeing the opposite, which is animals are having too much stimulation and no downtime. Dogs and cats like other predators need a lot of sleep. Uh, and they're not getting it. And when they don't get the rest and sleep and downtime that they need, they can become irritable and more aggressive. Uh, and you're gonna have different issues for different pets. Um, the social pets uh, are gonna really miss people coming, their favorite people, their favorite friends and animals. Um, 
the Shire pets may think that this is a boon. And for some of my patients that have fear issues and fear aggression, COVID's the best thing that ever happened to them. Um, and uh, you got differences in the environment, uh, environmental changes that are better or worse for active versus older sedentary dogs. For some of the active dogs, uh, it's great to have people have time to take them for those five mile a day walks or walks in the middle of the day. For the older sedentary dogs, like my poor dog, Travis, uh, after a few days into the pandemic, when my schedule was all disrupted, I was taking him for these really long walks and he started hiding from me. Uh, when I get out his leash and I thought, oh my gosh, this poor little guy doesn't wanna go for a seven mile walk. Uh, so these changes, uh, and frankly, I should know better, uh, but these changes in and of themselves, even good changes can cause stress. Uh, that change is inherently stressful for animals and it wears away at their resilience and it can make them uh, less flexible, um, less elastic. Uh, and why is this? Animals, uh, our pets are strangers in a strange land. Um, they read us very well, but they don't have language centers. So they often have no idea what's expected of them. And that's anxiety provoking. You don't know when you're gonna get your needs met. Uh, and, you're, and the way that you manage it is, but the way they manage it is by relying on the routine and predictability. Uh, and so when all that gets disrupted, they can get anxious, they don't know. It's as if instead of uh, knowing that you have an exam, uh, anatomy exam on Friday covering uh, four legs and uh, GI, all of a sudden you're told, well, you're gonna have an exam. Uh, we'll let you know when it's time to have the exam and we'll let you know what the subject of the exam is as well. Um, and as to grading, we're gonna grade it based on uh, some criteria, but we're not gonna tell you what it is. It may or may not have to do with what you uh, answer, uh, what answers you put down. So that uh, for, for our students here, that would be incredibly stressful. And for the dogs too, uh, and cats too, whose routines are changed and they go, they show up in the kitchen at mealtime and there's no food, or they bring you a ball and all of a sudden you're at work, they don't quite know what to do with that. Uh, so that's, that's stressful. Another stressor uh, that I think has come up during the pandemic uh, that's a little underrated, if you will, or, or undernoticed is untreated pain and discomfort. Uh, that's always a risk of aggression. Pain and discomfort uh, lower everybody's irritability threshold. Uh, think about coming home from a bad day at work and having a headache, it makes it that much worse. Uh, but during the pandemic, there's less access in the beginning, less access to veterinary care. So we were seeing more animals and sicker animals here at the emergency room, uh, the uh, emergency service at Tufts, and it's been true other places as well. Um, it, now we've got a rhythm of practices being open and we know how to provide veterinary care during the pandemic. Initially, uh, it was hard to find a vet, then people have financial constraints. Um, and then with all the human stressors, I think a lot of pet problems may have been flying under the radar as well and having to get worse before they were noticed. Um, and then there were a lot of new pet owners just at a time when practices were barely able to see the patients they had, much less take on new patients. So that was also challenging. Um, and this is the question I get asked most is, uh, what about our stress? Is our stress making our dogs and cats miserable? Um, are they stressed because they can pick up on our stress? Uh, we know that they reduce our stress. It's been a big boon during COVID. I, I love to get home and see my dogs or it's been a great thing to be able to do Zoom things and have my little dog sleeping at uh, near my feet. Um, but what about our stress? So this is a really interesting subject for me. Uh, do dogs and cats, less data on cats, uh, but there's a good amount of research done on dogs. And frankly, it's inconclusive. Uh, many of us have had the experience of crying and having the dog come over and nuzzle us or the cat come over and rub us. Um, and 
but is this true empathy? What are they actually, what's actually going on here? Some studies show that yes, dogs actually can recognize different emotional states in humans and that they will even use one side of the nostril to sniff the odors of people who are anxious and the other nostril to sniff neutral, uh, neutral valence odors from people. So uh, they're processing this information differently. Uh, and the studies, so some dogs show that even at the, ba the, you know, the most basic type of empathy is on um, emotional contagion, um, something like uh, shared yawning, and the evidence has been uh, inconclusive, actually, uh, about whether dogs had that. Uh, and so are they empathizing with us or not? Uh, that we don't know because there's some pretty big confounders uh, because we're rewarding certain types of behaviors. And when we're upset, our behaviors are changing. So we, uh, human stress uh, changes our behaviors. We may be more irritable. We may be, uh, have less patience. There may be more yelling and tears around the house. Uh, it changes the quantity and the quality of our interactions with our pets. Um, so whether or not it's because, uh, as some studies show, our dogs come over because they're empathic and when we're crying, they're trying to comfort us or whether they come over because we're doing something weird and, they ha and they're insecure and they're licking us uh, because they need reassurance because we're behaving in these untypical ways. Uh, or because when they come over, when we're crying to check out what's going on, why we're making these weird noises, we start petting them and telling them what good dogs and cats they are. So it's a learned behavior. Regardless of that, uh, I think it's important to uh, realize that in the absence of evidence that they are experiencing empathy and the absolute certainty that regardless of whether they're feeling empathy or not, they're certainly uh, negatively affected by environmental changes associated with human stress behaviors. I think it's uh, important to treat it as if the environment, uh, the changes in the environment are what matters uh, because that gives us room to uh, make positive change. If we think about feeling bad about feeling bad, that doesn't really help anyone. And I think about this as a veterinarian, if I tell people, wow, your dog is really stressed because you're stressed, first of all, I don't have good data that support that. And second of all, uh, it's just gonna make them feel bad about feeling bad, which makes the whole thing worse. When what I do know is a behaviorist that acting, it changing the way you act toward your animal can make a big difference. If you're feeling sad, but you make sure that you're feeding your dog at feeding time, you're playing with your dog, you're walking your dog, you're getting out your fishing toy in the evening and playing with your cat, um, they're going to feel better regardless of you being sad. Um, and uh, one possibility that is out of my area of expertise is that making your pet make, feel good may in fact make you feel better too. Uh, so um, I think about this as a veterinarian, what are we gonna do? This can apply to other people, other educators uh, and, uh, and parents and pet owners, but you wanna make sure if your pet's behavior is changing, whether it's during COVID or whether it's not during COVID, you first wanna rule out medical problems. I can tell you I've seen a number of bites that have occurred uh, and dogs come to me as a behaviorist. I examine the dog, they've got a raging ear infection. We treat the ears and the problem goes away. So things that respond to, that have behavioral implications can have underlying medical problems that either are the cause or the contributor. Um, another role that veterinarians can have, and here's where uh, a lot of other people in the community can jump in, is education about supervising children and how, uh, what are appropriate ways of, for children to interact with dogs, the use of gates and crates and basket muzzles, um, teaching people or learning about canine and feline body language. So we can, uh, they can't use their words, but they use a lot of gestures and postures uh, and sounds to share with us what it is they're thinking uh, that can really help us avoid problems 
uh, that would otherwise develop, could otherwise develop into aggression for that directed toward us or just depression on their part. Um, making sure that the, the animal is getting what they need, uh, proper exercise, mental stimulation, uh, and that reduces anxiety and irritability. Um, veterinarians can also offer behavior modification for specific problems or even medication. Uh, Getting too realistic, when we're looking at bite prevention, this is stuff that I would uh, talk about when we're not in COVID. I mean, this is a non-COVID issue too, is we have to set real ex realistic expectations for, for children and how children interact with dogs. These pictures, and I love this, uh, I, know, I love this thing uh, that I found uh, that shows all these things. There are all these things you see on the internet. Uh, I would see them in clinic. Um, that uh, where the dogs are showing body language of distress uh, and we see them as cute and kids are behaving with the animals in ways that are dangerous. Uh, so one of the ways to address that is to just come up with a plan for rules. Um, no rough play or hyper arousal uh, with the dogs and with young children, no supervised handling by children. And it, uh, it can be a heavy thing to say, you must supervise your children always uh, when they're young, under five years old or six years old and under, some variation with kids. But before that, they're not gonna reliably take instruction about what's an appropriate way to manage a dog. And with more face time, you're gonna see more of these uh, incidents that result in aggression. You gotta respect the resting place, meals and toys. And then, Rather than teaching people to crouch down and stick a, a hand in a dog's face, I prefer, to, I prefer to have them learn the pet don't pet protocol, also called consent petting, where you go, you have the dog come to you, you wait, if you put down a hand down, not out, and you, uh, and if they move closer to you, then you give them a few scritches, you stop, you wait till they indicate again by moving closer or engaging. If they disengage, you walk away. Um, there's wonderful resources out there on body language. Dr. Sophia Yin has some, fearfreepets.com has wonderful, uh, wonderful stuff, uh, resources for uh, clients and veterinarians, resources for people. There's great tools for uh, general management as well. Um, a lot and when people have more time on their hands at home, if you're the people that are lucky enough to have more time on your hands during COVID, uh, and that's a good thing for you, uh, then it's a great time to uh, work on consistency and predictability with positive reinforcement training. Um, punishment, especially physical punishment, um, only tells dogs, it increases anxiety, but any punishment just tells dogs what not to do. It doesn't tell them what to do. Uh, and likewise with cats as well. Uh, so you wanna make sure that for all the people that are getting new dogs that they're uh, engaging, meeting their basic needs and engaging in uh, interactions that are helpful. Uh, no parents or anybody can uh, be on in two places or on 24 seven. So uh, one of the things with COVID is I feel like I've been telling everybody get a gate. Uh, Put your dog behind a gate. Um, it's not meant to be a punishment. Give them something good to enjoy back there. But dogs and cats need downtime. Uh, that one of the things that we find is all of a sudden they've gone from defined times where they were uh, available for interaction to being on call 24 seven. And that's gotten old for some animals. So a physical barrier uh, can be a good thing. A basket muzzle is another. Um, there's a great uh, project called the Muzzle Up Project uh, that talks all about basket muzzles, how to introduce them gradually, which is really important, um, and uh, how to use them. You still don't want uh, people doing things to dogs they don't like when they're wearing basket muzzles, but uh, if there's a slip up, at least nobody gets hurt. Um, Another important safety tool is uh, that I think is really fundamental, especially during COVID time, is give the dog a safe space that they can go to. You can have it be behind a gate, uh, 
but you want that to be the dog's place. It, some dogs prefer it to be nearby behind the gate, others completely separate, especially if there's children that can't respect the gate. Um, you can have it be your dog's choice or your own choice. And that space becomes a do not approach zone. When the dog is in that space, you can call them or the cat is in their safe space, you can call them, but they, if they don't come, you leave them alone and you try again later. It becomes their safe, really sacred space where they can go to retreat. Um, for dogs that are already sensitized and growling when people are walking by them, uh, I'll have people do growl zone training where you maintain the perimeter of this safe space, but when you walk by and the dog is awake, as long as you stay outside of that perimeter, uh, you can toss in some food and that can help the dog start to think of people walking nearby their safe space or even having a slip up and walking into their safe space is something that's positive. Uh, it's some basic positive counter conditioning. There's some great resources for safe space training as well as basket muzzle training. Um, and uh, this is a this uh, dog mind it offers one that's uh, positive reinforcement based. You can either teach the dog to go to a mat or you can just teach them to go to a particular safe room. Um, I'm a big fan of pet tech. Uh, these are remote reward devices. The pet tutor is a very sophisticated device. The treat and train is a um, very simple, uh, my kind of thing. You take it out of the box, you put the batteries in and it's so intuitive, you can just uh, do it. Uh, and they both have a lot of videos with them that teach how to use it. But this allows you to reinforce your dog for appropriate behavior, say behind a gate, lying down quietly when you're not there, when you're up at your office. Uh, on Zoom. So uh, what about cats? Same thing. The one thing that I would change with cats is you want to make sure that uh, they've got plenty of elevated spaces. Cats are most comfortable when they're high up off the ground. So you want to make sure they're going to be high up off the ground. Uh, so there's big cat trees um, in a really stressed environment. You want to have the cat be able to negotiate the room where people are because they want to be where the action is, but out of reach. Medication, if you have a highly stressed pet, I, I think it's reasonable to talk to your veterinarian about possible medication, even if it's contextual. If, you're, if your dog or cat is super stressed and miserable because of all the activity and changes during COVID, medication may be a benefit. You have a new dog or a new cat with serious problems, Waiting sometimes doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense. So this is a conversation that's worth having with the veterinarian if you're concerned. Depression and withdrawal, closely related to uh, the aggression thing. You've got the animals that are on 24 seven, they're on call, they want someone to take away their pager. Uh, they've got constant unwanted contact, no time to rest, loss of quality of life activities. For some dogs, it makes them more irritable. For some cats, it makes them more irritable. For others, it just makes them hide. So the treatments are gonna be the same, downtime, safe spaces, avoid negative interactions, increase consistency and predictability, rule out medical issues. For this one, I'd also look for confounders like noise phobia. The dog may be fine with everybody at home, but can't stand the fireworks. Um, the other big problem I've seen is nuisance barking. Uh, territorial barking, alarm barking, attention seeking and demand barking. It's not usually a big deal because mostly people are gone during the day, uh, but now uh, you're trying to work on your uh, Zoom meeting and you've got this vocalization that's going on all day. So in order to figure out what's causing my vocalization, you need to figure out when it's happening, where it's happening, and at whom, at whom it's directed. What are you trying to tell me, Buzz? There you go. I, it, um, one of the big problems I, is territorial and alarm barking. Re it's normal for dogs to alarm bark. And now all of a sudden there's more deliveries and there's more activity at home 
And so there's more opportunities to bark. People are walking by at all times of day now since they're working from home. And so dogs that generally just bark during the high traffic times in the morning and the evening now are barking all day because there's things to bark at. Um, and people are noticing it more because they're trying to do their schooling or their work at home. So it's become a really serious problem by uh, this territorial and alarm barking. And then there's abnormal too. You have fearful dogs that are completely overreacting to every little sound in the environment. Um, so how do you treat territorial and alarm barking? How do you recognize it? It's not directed in your face. It's directed out the window or at the door or with the dog running back and forth, uh, barking at something else as opposed to to you or at you. Um, you have to reduce exposure to the triggers. I love these stick-on um, translucent uh, privacy films that you can put on windows. You can just close the door to the room that they go in to monitor and bark for. Um, noise, uh, white noise is really helpful too. You also, for if you're really serious, you can get uh, these sound uh, blocking curtains. Um, and uh, other kind of major sound blocking things. There's some products that dogs will wear like mutt muffs, they cover their ears, so they don't hear as many sounds. Um, or crit ears is a new one um, that are sound blocking devices for dogs. Uh, but you have to reduce the exposure. With this kind of territorial barking, I mean, sometimes it's the dogs don't have to know what, uh, they don't uh, have a job to do. They're not getting as much stimulation. They're not, not getting as many walks. So they're restless. So they give themselves a job of alerting you every time something happens outside. So you want to increase their activity. You can do an activity with them like nose work. They're great nose work classes that are online now. Many trainers have gone online. Um, you can get, I love this product, I dig. You hide food or toys in the different layers. And for digging dogs that like to dig them out, snuffle mats, licky mats, kongs, you can feed them their meals and puzzle toys um, and or give them part of their meal and puzzle toys so that they can um, have activity during the day. Um, the other thing is, is it's really hard to get a dog not to bark at all because you're training against genetics. Dogs bark. Uh, there may be reasons why they're barking more, but it's still hard to suppress barking and it's especially hard to do it quickly. So you want to avoid the, tra the triggers when you're not training, do discrete training sessions, brief. It can be three to five minutes. You can start with 30 second training if that's your dog's attention span. Um, clicker training works best. Uh, you teach them to, you, it, you're not teaching them not to bark, but you're putting an off switch on the barking. So they're going rah, 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 you go quiet. When they're quiet, you click them, you give them a reward, you gradually extend the period of quiet uh, they must maintain before you give them uh, their reward. If you combine this with a remote reward delivery device that you move away from the window, they may start running toward the device after you said quiet to get the reward, thereby moving away from the stimulus. So quiet on cue is a really, really great uh, tool for addressing barking as well as avoidance. Um, like a lot of things, yelling makes it worse. Uh, it increases arousal and increased arousal increases the alarm. You could argue also that they may think you're barking and so you're getting some socially facilitated barking. But raising their arousal when they're already in warning mode is not gonna be helpful. So just a quiet followed up consistently with a reward. Other causes of barking that have been a problem are attention-seeking barking or other attention-seeking behaviors. Um, it, uh, that's my dog, Travis, who's just about to begin to bark there at me early in the pandemic when I was teaching. Uh, insufficient stimulation triggers that new context, new rules. We're now on call 24 seven too. We're kind of a sitting buck, duck. And when they come and they see that we're in the screen and they bark at us, we immediately have to pet them or give them treats to shut them up. And so they kind of have us over a barrel. Uh, they also don't really know when we're available and when we're not. So getting back into a routine can be really helpful. You can also see an increase in anxiety associated barking or attention seeking because they're more worried with all the changes in the environment. 
Uh, and so then you need to, again, get back into a routine, um, predictable environment, make it clear when you're on and when you're off. And when you're off, you're putting them in their safe space or having them do a quiet activity near you. I'm looking down at the floor because I'm um, so used to seeing my dog there doing his quiet activities when I'm on online now. Um, so you wanna make sure they're getting the best treatments for, extra, for uh, attention seeking or learned behaviors. Uh, not that people are teaching them, but the dogs are learning them because they get inadvertently rewarded for doing the behavior. Exercise and mental stimulation, they need another job. Uh, strategic avoidance, give them alternative activities, that nice stuffed Kong um, or the catnip toy, bring it out just when you need it so that your cat has something else to do besides sitting on your computer uh, keyboard. Uh, the gold standard is ignoring an unwanted behavior to extinction, uh, which is great in theory, but sometimes uh, not possible. And you can't tell someone, I'm sorry, uh, we've got this day long seminar and my dog is just gonna bark you for six hours. So if you can just ignore it until it extinguishes, uh, that would be a big help, not realistic. So you gotta reinforce acceptable other behaviors. So when your dog is quiet, reinforce them. And you're gonna get, and then avoid, uh, either with strategic avoidance or uh, the best way to win a fight is not to be there. What about attention seeking cats? Same thing. Uh, you wanna give them uh, strategic avoidance. Uh, Sometimes you can just modify the behavior if they want to sit on your keyboard, get a nice heated bed. If they sell them online and you can put it right next to the keyboard and have re reinforce your cat with pets and treats to remain next to the keyboard and not on the keyboard. <laughs> That's a great next for the cat, cat wheel Hi. for indoor cats. Like I said, it's not all bad for many dogs uh, and many cats. It's been nothing but a boon. They've got us to offer mental stimulation, especially the pets that spent too much time isolated or the very, very social pets. Um, Stephanie, I'm sorry. You told me to interrupt you when it's 1245. Perfect. <laughs> I have two more slides uh, that I want to mention, and these are the re-entry problems. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, so separation anxiety is a big problem that we see with re-entry, uh, as well as uh, insufficient stimulation of the COVID puppies. The dogs that are at greatest risk are the ones with a previous diagnosis of separation anxiety that's in remission. They're at risk of relapses, as well as the puppies that were never left alone. We know that's a risk factor. Um, so uh, how do we prevent this? Uh, start now. Uh, I, I've been telling people since the beginning of the the pandemic, I'm glad you have so much time to take your dog with you everywhere on walks. Now I want you to take some walks without your dog. They must learn to be alone. Otherwise they don't know how to do it. So you leave them alone briefly, make it positive from the start. That's when you whip out a special toy or a treat to give them when you leave positive counter conditioning. Consistency helps a consistent departure ritual. Bye, be good boy, here's your calm. Uh, and then having a cue response reward protocol for how you interact with the dogs so that they understand their environment makes them more resilient and elastic. It changes like leaving and positive reinforcement training, which opens communication and builds independence. Um, for dogs that are already affected, you're gonna you consider medication. Uh, talk to the veterinarian about medication and consider a behavior modification program like uh, graduated departures. On um, those you can start, if you have a dog with separation anxiety, practicing graduated departures when you don't have to leave during COVID is super helpful. Um, puppy socialization, people are worried about what happens if their puppy can't get socialized. Um, socialization doesn't mean they have to see every single thing in the world. You still want to expose them to as many things as possible in a gentle way without overexposing, but during that critical period. So you don't want to wait until COVID's over to expose them and get them out. But if they don't have strangers petting them, it's not the end of the world. Dogs are never exposed to everything. Summer dogs are never going to see people in puppy coats, for example. Uh, 
you just expose them to a variety of things, it builds resilience, it builds a sense that there's a lot of variation in the world and it's mo mostly okay. Uh, you can't socialize an older dog, it's a developmental window and once it's closed, it's closed. If a dog is fearful of things and they're older, just exposing may not be helpful. That's something to talk to a behaviorist or your veterinarian about. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions. If we do, I am happy to take them. Okay, um, we do have um, a couple questions and let's see. Um, well, Emily McCobb had a, was saying that they are still letting off fireworks in her town on most weekend nights, which <laughs> that's not a question, but that's definitely part of what you were talking about of the problems. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> um, Martha Grace is asking, what advice do you have when we re-enter a new normal? A new normal. So dogs can transition and cats can transition from one routine to another. Is it rocky? Sure. That's why I think positive counter conditioning is really important and starting to introduce the new normal gradually. We didn't get to introduce the lockdown gradually. It just happened. But we can reintroduce going back gradually. So spend more time away from your pet right now. Uh, make sure that they're gradually more comfortable, make positive associations with being, uh, with your pet being alone. Um, start, if you're thinking about having a dog walker, now is a good time to introduce the dog walker. When people aren't, uh, if you've got a dog that gets super overexcited when people come to the door, now is a great time to start working on some uh, door side ritual behavior because when people start coming, you'll have a good solid foundation that will ease them back into the return of regular visitors. Quick question, who is this adorable canine? That is my dog Dickens. Uh, he's uh, 14 years old, he's always been deaf and now he's going blind. So he's my, uh, he's my COVID project. He's a great little dog. Um, Thank you for asking. <laughs> We have, um, does clicker training and quiet on cue work for cats who meow excessively? Yes, but like dogs vocalizing, you really need to figure out what the motivation is. So if the cat is meowing at you for attention, for example, as opposed to uh, meowing uh, for you know, meal time, it can be, or for other, you know, as part of play, um, it can be tough uh, because if you reward it with attention, reward your cat with attention, you're likely to get more of it, even if the attention is clicker training. So yes, you can, but be aware that uh, you may get some unwanted behaviors that you need to shape away. Uh, and that if you do that in isolation, that's more likely to happen. So if your cat is meowing for attention, you may want to provide more exercise and stimulation so they have more of a, a life. You also, while you're clicker training them to be quiet, which certainly can work, um, as long as it's not, a, I guess what I'm saying is a meow for attention versus a meow for distress. Um, if they're meowing for attention, clicker training can work, but you also want to make sure you're not rewarding the unwanted behavior. So if you want not, if you don't want your cat to be meowing at you for attention, you can't reward them with attention sometimes and click or train them for remaining quiet other times. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, she's also asking if you can recommend a book or other resource to help with training or promoting good behavior in cats. Do you want me to put that in the reply email? Um, yes, and I can just tell you quickly, decoding your cat. It's Excellent. just out on the market. Uh, and it's a superb book uh, about how cats think and how to work with your cat and how to even address some uh, problems that come up uh, in the human feline relationship. Excellent, thank you. Um, another one, um, hi, you mentioned that dogs do not have a language center in their brains. What are your thoughts on dogs on social media, such as what about Bunny, that use word buttons to communicate? Do you think these lines of communication could be used to better understand animals? Um, 
it can certainly open communication. So when I say they don't understand language, it doesn't mean they can't make an association between a word and an object or a word and an activity. Um, that they certainly can, uh, but they don't have the ability and they can uh, even recognize like wonder uh, a, a thousand different uh, objects, each by name. So the language center really is what allows for grammar and syntax and things like that. What they're doing is they're making an association between a sound and something that they don't, they don't do grammar, if that makes sense. So certainly any of these things, can you get a dog to press a button that says out when they want to go out? Certainly. Same as getting a dog to ring a bell at a door to get you to open the door. Um, they're saying what they want because they were able to make an association between this object that has this writing on it. Uh, this, they don't recognize it as writing, they just recognize it as shapes that an object with these shapes on it, when they push on it, it has this consequence. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think it's huge. And I actually think things like that can go a long way to helping us appreciate our pets more, the sophistication of how they think, but they can open communication, which is important and reduce frustration. Um, any, these, they're wonderful tools. They're just a lot of work to teach, uh, but I love teaching my dogs things to be able to ask for what they want. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, oh, how should you behave if you encounter an agitated dog who is unknown to you? That is a great question uh, to just about this. You know, this is a re-entry question because right now uh, for dogs that are agitated and fearful, COVID again is one of those things they wish it would never end. Uh, because social distancing has been so great for my fearful and fear aggressive patients because nobody comes up and tries to pet them. Uh, but dogs certainly can come out and when an agitated dog does, the best thing to do is to uh, stand still in most cases and disengage on um, look away. I like what they tell kids is be a tree, stand still, cross your limbs so you don't have hands dangling and look at your roots. I actually got to try that uh, when I was doing a walking tour and a dog came roaring out of someone's house. These two dogs were barking and circling me. And I thought, oh, cool, be a tree. Uh, so I crossed my, uh, crossed my arms and uh, looked at my roots and they just kind of stopped and thought, it is boring. Then I started to move, they came back, I was a tree again. They stopped and then their owner came out and got them. So usually uh, what you want to do with a dog that's agitated is you want to disengage. At the same time I say disengaging, don't turn your back. Oh. Uh, because a fearful dog, uh, they're kind of like the American Revolution where they shoot from the bushes instead of marching up in front of the red coats. Um, so you don't want to turn your back, uh, but you want to keep your eye on them, but you want to disengage disengage. Excellent. Thank you. Um, how much time do we have? Oh, we have a couple minutes. Um, let's see. A kitten jumps up and, and slides down leg frequently, trying hard to ignore behavior, but challenging. How long until it goes away? Um, it may be, uh, it may not go away if the only thing you're doing is ignoring, because frankly, uh, and this is where I feel like we undersell animals a little bit that are doing something to get our attention or to solicit play, um, is if you ignore one thing without solving the underlying motivator for the problem, it's just going to be like whack-a-mole. It's going to come up doing something else. If you can stand there while your legs are getting shredded, uh, they'll find something else to do, like break your favorite china by throwing it off of a shelf if what they need is attention. Um, and so you want to make sure if, the, if it's playfulness, then you want to increase the enrichment uh, and playtime for your kitten. Um, you also want to proactively avoid the opportunity for that behavior to happen. Oftentimes kittens will leap out at you from underneath something. Mm -hmm. um, you can use a positive interrupter too, to interrupt the behavior. Uh, and 
if you need to, sometimes with kittens, you can stay ahead of the behavior by say, carrying a ping pong ball with you. And when you walk by that place, you engage the kitten in another alternative behavior. So they never start. Uh, That's a good example. In your legs. And then cats actually really do well with clicker training too. So you can clicker train them to uh, go somewhere where you're not like go up on their tree. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more um, online. We'll, we'll answer all the others um, by email and um, stuff like that. So um, this one is, what if the dog is so excited about barking at a truck that they won't even take a treat? So that's, a, that's actually uh, a, frequent, a frequent thing. So with that, uh, you, can, you need to start, if you're gonna reduce the behavior, desensitize them, say, to barking at trucks or get them to be in a point where you can even uh, reach them, you need to be at a sufficient distance from the truck. So you can teach them uh, in the moment you can, uh, there's not a whole lot you can do if you can't reach them except get them out of there. But you can practice with trucks where you teach them an alternative strategy. You teach them to look at you uh, and then you move closer and closer and closer to trucks when they go by. If you drill the behavior where they, they look at you and they disengage from what's going on in the road, starting with trucks that are farther away, there's another way of doing it in real time, uh, then uh, reward them for disengaging, then they can gradually handle it with closer and closer trucks. So it's more of a matter of failing better each time in the real world, to quote a smoking cessation specialist. Uh, it, um, you're gonna gradually have more and more successes. For dogs that are downright phobic, you've got a different issue. Uh, mm. But you can, I think you know, for a lot of this, a clicker can be helpful too. You reward them for looking at you and disengaging and then gradually increase the intensity of the exposure to trucks. Uh, you can, if that makes sense. I think that makes sense. I'm trying to, um, thank you very much. And um, can you see the upcoming events I just shared? Is that I working? Can, yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, I have, just want to make sure. So um, I wanted to thank you so much for coming today and talking and see if there was anything you wanted to wrap up with. Um, I, I think the thing that I want to wrap up with is, uh, is something good about COVID in terms of our, in our, uh, of our relationship with pets is I think for the first time, a lot of us really get what it's like to be an indoor cat, um, that we don't just turn off in the day when we're in our house. Uh, we need social interaction. Uh, we need play, we need a job to do. Uh, and that's the same with our cats. I think we can come out of this with the real empathy uh, for our cats. And likewise, uh, a much better understanding of uh, who our animals are and what they need. Um, it's been an interesting social experiment, mm. uh, but I think it's given us the opportunity to have a much, much deeper understanding of our animals. And I'm optimistic that that's gonna stick.